One of the most exciting fossil finds from Africa in the last 30 years is that of the Nere Kadame specimen from the western shores of Lake Turkana, this specimen right here to my left. This specimen, as you can see, is perhaps the most complete fossil specimen we have in the fossil record. It's a skeleton that's roughly 70 to 75 percent complete, which means it preserves a tremendous wealth of information about the early evolution of fossil hominins in Africa, in this case dating to about 1.6 million years of age. So looking more closely at Nerikadame, we can see the tremendous amount of information that provides us. Again, the site itself is located on the western shores of Lake Turkana, so part of the Turkana Basin region in general. But the specimen, as you can see, preserves a huge amount of information. We have a nearly complete skull, a complete mandible, much of the upper thorax. We have partial complete upper arm. We have both sides of the pelvis partially preserved, and both of the lower limbs are almost fully preserved. The main elements we're lacking on the Nerikadame specimen are the distal limb segments, or the hands and feet, basically. This is a common taphonomic problem, as actually these small bones are easy for small mammals or rodents to actually pull away from remains and actually chew and get the fat out of. So it's actually not uncommon to not have these distal limb appendages present. But still, the Nerikadame specimen preserves this wealth, tremendous wealth of information. Looking at it a little bit more closely, one of the most striking things about Nerikadame, and the first thing to point out, is that its limb proportions are almost identical to that of a modern human. Indeed, you would have a hard time rejecting the idea that the postcranial skeleton of Nerikadame, what it preserves from the neck down, is not unlike what we see in a human today. There are subtle differences, but those differences, as I say, are very subtle. Small things like how rotated is the humerus relative to the proximal joint how rotated is the lower limb. But in terms of the overall limb proportions, one of the things Nerikadame gives us clear evidence of is that by this point, 1.6 million years of age, there's clear evidence of expanded lower limb length. This lower limb of Nerikadame is very tall. Indeed, although Nerikadame is a juvenile individual, not yet an adult, his size at this point was already more than five feet tall, about 155 to 160 centimeters reconstructed height at this point. So he was already quite a tall individual, even though he probably had a lot of growing left to do. And a lot of that height is preserved in his lower leg. So the leg of this individual suggests a degree of energetic efficiency had already been achieved at this stage in the early evolution of perhaps Homo erectus. That lower limb, recall that when you're moving in a bipedal way, when you're engaged in a bipedal gait, an important part of that process is that swing phase, where your leg actually, you would propel your leg forward, but then it actually swings into position. So there's a bit of a pendulum effect in that motion. Having a longer leg increases the pendulum effect, so it increases the energetic efficiency. So part of the anatomy of Nerikadame suggests that there's perhaps selection for increased energetic efficiency, particularly energetic efficiency over long distances. Now again, this shouldn't be surprising given the material we covered in the class last week, but it's fantastic to see that evidence preserved in the fossil record in a specimen like Nerikadame. Now, one of the questions about Nerikadame is how tall would Nerikadame have been? As I said, at death, he's maybe five to five feet two inches in height, or about 155 to 160 centimeters. But how much growing he had left to do depends on two things. First, how old is he actually at present? And then what model of growth do we assume? Particularly what model of an adolescent growth spurt, the kind of growth spurt that we have when we reach puberty, would Nerikadame have experienced? Looking in a little more closely at this specimen, one of the things you can see, for example, in the lower limb, is you see a lot of gaps here in actually the distal end ends of these bones. For example, you have an unfused distal epiphysis. This is how your long bones grow, is they're actually unfused ends on oftentimes the proximal and the distal end of these bones. As the bone grows, it grows at these points. These are the, the growth surfaces, or the epiphyses. As the bone stops growing, these bones fuse together and form a solid element. So you see that these are unfused in the proximal tibia, the distal fibula, the distal tibia, even parts of the proximal femur. So much of these bones are still unfused, suggesting there's a lot of growing left to do. This is true as we look at the upper remains as well. Here you see the upper humerus, the proximal humerus is also unfused. So it turns out though, if we compare actually the stage of development in Nerikadame to living humans, the pattern of skeletal fusion is pretty much exactly the same pattern we see today. So if we look at this specimen from 1.6 million years of age, what we see is that the overall pattern of development, how the skeleton is growing, how the elements are fusing, is already converged onto what is essentially the modern pattern. 
And what's fantastic is actually we have a similar age specimen from Dimenisi, the D2700 individual subadult, which is similar in age, perhaps a year or two years older in age, dating to about 1.75 million years of age. And what we can see is that the pattern of fusion, pattern of development actually in Nericotome, matches what we see in Dimenisi. So we have confirming evidence again of essentially a modern kind of growth pattern in these early erectus specimens from about 1.7 to 1.6 million years of age. Now, of course, Nericotome isn't the earliest possible erectus specimen from Africa. It's simply the most complete. Recall the earlier specimens, such as KNM ER 3733, shown here, which itself may in fact be representative of a very early erectus from Africa. And the features that we see in common here are a well developed torus, although on the Nericotome specimen it's not fully preserved. We see a still a somewhat prognathic face, particularly in the lower face. Broad anterior dentition, particularly in this Nericotome specimen preserved here. Um, but overall, a reduced dentition relative to many of the earlier hominids that we've observed. Expanded brain size, in this case in both individuals, of over 750 cc's, even over 800 cc's presumably. Um, so a number of these features that we have in common, and indeed features that we can also see in the lateral view. So the beginning of a more developed frontal bone here associated with expanded brain size. The Nericotome frontals aren't fully developed here, but you could imagine them developing a superorbital torus not unlike K&M ER 3733. You have a slightly elongated specimen in both Nericotome and uh, 3733. And again, you can see that flatness of the face and the overall beginnings of what appears to be a much more modern architecture to the skull, associated with the reduced dentition, reduced masticatory abilities, and expanded brain size. And again, some of these features we can see in earlier specimens, including those from Dimenisi that we've already talked about. Here we see that individual I just referenced, the D2700 individual from Dimenisi, compared to Nericotome. And again, you can see similarities not just in the overall form, but in the relative stage of development of these individuals. So the Nericotome specimen as a whole provides us this wonderful glimpse as to what the earliest erectus from Africa may have looked like. Not just in terms of the cranial morphology, but the complete skeletal pattern. And one of the interesting things, again, is that both energetically we see evidence of selection for increased energetic efficiency over long distance transportation, associated with that expanded linear body size. But we also see evidence of a convergence onto a modern developmental pattern in terms of the timing and sequence of fusion of different skeletal elements. All of these give us important clues as to the early evolution of our lineage, the early evolution of the genus Homo, which we'll talk more about as this week and the subsequent weeks go on.